love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Surprised by a mercy that's new every morn Awaken my soul to sing Oh, awaken my soul to sing I will trust
Good morning, happy Sunday. Welcome to New Garden Online. If this is your first time joining us, my name is Jeff. I'm the lead minister at New Garden and I'm excited you're with us today. We're in week nine of our year long series, Long Story Short. We're reading through the whole Bible this year and today we're in our fifth book, Deuteronomy. We have breezed our way through Genesis, 
Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And we're going to spend this week and next week in Deuteronomy. But we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. First, let's get into the chat room. Let's say good morning. Let us know how you're doing today. And let's answer a question. There are so many historical events that it would have been cool to see or people to meet. So the question today, if you had a time machine, when would you visit? Welcome to New Garden. It's good to be back with y'all for another Sunday as we are working through the Bible together. You know, we have been in this series called Long Story Short for about two months now, and tomorrow is March 1st. And if you haven't jumped in in our reading plan, what better way to start off March than by joining in with us as we read through the Bible. You can find the reading plan at newgarden.church slash 2021. And you can also join in Tuesday nights at seven o'clock. We have a Zoom meeting where we talk about what we've been reading that week and any questions that you may have. And we would love to see you there. And you can find that link at newgarden.church slash chat. Um, please check in today, all right? This is the last Sunday in February, which means it's the last Sunday that we're partnering with Souls for Souls right now. And every 10 check-ins provides a pair of shoes to somebody in need. So go ahead, hop on Facebook or Instagram and check in at New Garden Church to give back and help provide a pair of shoes for somebody that needs it. If this is your first time with us at New Garden, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. We are so glad that you joined us and we want you to feel welcome. We wish we could connect with you in person, but for now, we would love to connect with you online. And if you look at the top of your screen, you'll see a button that says connection card. If you click there, you will find a page that will help you get signed up for our newsletter, and then you'll get to pick one of four charities. And whichever charity you choose, we are going to donate $10 to that charity. So if this is your first time with us, or if you haven't filled out a connection card before, please go ahead and click on that link, make the leap, and connect with us and give back for free. We are so glad that you are here. If you are a kid or you have a kid here is your reminder that there are video lessons and resources for kids on our website if you visit newgarden.church slash kids online you are going to find a new video for your child every week as well as a new resource for them to connect with the lesson and some good ways for you to connect with your kids about the lesson. So please, if you haven't checked that out and you are a parent to a kid, um, go ahead and hop on our website and check it out. And don't forget that coming up, we are going to be meeting on Easter to celebrate together. So please mark your calendars for April 4th. We are really excited to be able to have an Easter celebration in a fun and safe way. We would love for you to join us. So more details to come on that. But for now, just make sure to mark your calendar for Easter Sunday. And we want to celebrate together. Um, We are just really excited that you're here. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, Thank you for being here online. And uh, welcome to New Garden.
Good morning, who's ready for week nine of Long Story Short? Now, if this is your first time, again, we're taking a year-long journey through the Bible. We've got a daily reading plan that you're invited to use. We have book overviews. We have a Facebook group where you can talk, ask questions. You can find all of that and more on our website at newgarden.church slash 2021. But again, the main idea is not to read all of the Bible. The main idea is to get into the Bible on a daily basis and let the Word of God lead us and change us. Now, for those, those of us on the reading plan, yesterday we began a new book, Deuteronomy. We're going to spend today and next Sunday looking at some of the key ideas from this book. Now, Deuteronomy is set after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness with this new generation that's ready to enter the promised land. Moses gathers them all together and he gives them one final message. He recounts Israel's rebellion and God's grace up to that point. And then he calls them to covenant faithfulness. He shares laws for Israel's worship and the leaders as well for their like civil and social life. And at the conclusion of the speech, Moses gives them a warning and an ultimatum. To listen and obey God will lead to blessing, but to disobey will lead to devastation and exile. Now Moses knows the people well enough to know they're eventually going to choose rebellion. Yet even then, Moses looked forward to a future day when God would give Israel a new heart so they could fully love God and live. Today, I want to focus on a couple verses that we will read tomorrow in our reading plan in chapter 6. It's typically, typically called the Shema, and I'm pretty sure most of us have heard it before. Uh, one reason you may be familiar with it is because Jesus refers to it when he's asked about which is the greatest command. Jesus reaches back all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 6 for the answer. Moses is speaking to all the people and says this, Listen, Israel. Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. And you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The heart of the Shema is a call to listen and obey by devoting your emotions and your will to God alone. Now it gets its name Shema from the first Hebrew word of the prayer, listen, or in Hebrew, Shema. In traditional Jewish prayer practice, these lines from Deuteronomy 6 were combined with a few other passages from the Torah, and they were prayed daily, both in the morning and in the evening. Now, this prayer has been one of the most influential traditions in Jewish history, and it can still speak to us today. But as we have seen from other passages, when you read something that's translated from a different language, from a different culture that we are removed from by thousand, a few thousand years, taking things at their face value sometimes leads to confusion, misinterpretation, or just missing like a deeper meaning. For instance, from ancient times, there has been much debate on how exactly to translate and interpret the Shema, because there's some ambiguity in the grammar of the main sentences. Uh, Dr. Tim Mackey points out that there is no present tense verb equivalent to the English verb is in ancient Hebrew. Like there is a word for was and one for will be, but is doesn't exist. Rather, two words are just put next to each other and the word is is inferred. So in English, we would say the car is blue, but in ancient Hebrew, it would be the car blue. Now, ancient Israelites obviously had a concept for the verb is. They just didn't use the word to express it in their language. Instead, they used this grammar tool of simply placing two words together. So the problem in translating and interpreting the Shema arises from the fact that it's made up of two back-to-back -back sentences that lack the word is. In Hebrew, the prayer consists of four nouns in a row. Yahweh, Eloheinu, Yahweh, Echad. So, Lord, our God, Lord, one. So, as you can see, we've got four words. And depending on where you place the word is, you can end up with a few different sentences. Yahweh, our God, is one Yahweh. Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. Yahweh, our God. Yahweh is one. Now, at the end of the day, the meaning between these options isn't drastically different, but each one has a different emphasis. Like, is the point that Yahweh God is one and not many, like options one and three? Or is the emphasis on the fact that Yahweh is our God, option number two? Does the Shema claim that Israel's God is one being? Or is it highlighting that Yahweh alone is Israel's God and not any other? It seems like the last meaning seems to fit the overall context of Deuteronomy a lot better. In other words, the Shema isn't trying to make this philosophical statement about God's essence or being that God is one. 
Rather, the Shema is a pledge of allegiance to Yahweh, the God of Israel that excludes allegiance to any other gods. Now, this makes sense as you think about Israel's past and their future. The Israelites have been steeped in polytheistic cultures for generations, like from their roots in Canaan to their long years in Egypt to their traveling through the wilderness of Canaan on, you know, on the way to the promised land. They've been surrounded by people worshiping many different gods. So Moses reminds this new generation that loyalty, obedience, and love to their one true God is the only way to life. Now, as you listen to the rest of Deuteronomy, you're going to see this thing continue to grow. One of the greatest threats to Israel's future was dividing their allegiance between many gods. And so at the beginning of this instruction, the Shema is a daily reminder that Yahweh, our God alone, is our God. Now, that's a lot of information about four words, but there are a few other key words in this prayer that I think we need to pay attention to. Because again, when we read these words, sometimes we bring our 2021 definition and meeting and read it back into a text where it meant something different. Uh, the words I want to highlight are listen, love, heart, soul, and strength. We would talk about Lord, but we've already discussed how that word represents the personal name of God, Yahweh. Now, I could spend the next few minutes going over each one of these words, trying to do my best to explain while keeping your attention, but we're going to do something different today. The crew at the Bible Project did a series of videos explaining these very words. So today, I'm passing the ball to them for the middle of my lesson, and then I'll come back at the end and kind of close with a few thoughts. Now, I have to warn you, though. This is going to be a fire hose of information. If you're a note taker, you might be better off just listening, putting your pencil down, and then going back and watching it all again. I'll post the videos on our website so you can re-watch them because they condense what could easily be like 30-minute lessons per word into a three-minute video per word. But I hope that this gives us a greater appreciation for what it means to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength. So I'm going to play these videos back to back to back to back. So take a deep breath, ready your mind, and I'll see you in about 17 minutes. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Now, the first word of the Shema is hear or listen, which in Hebrew is pronounced Shema. That's where the prayer gets its name. Now, Shema is a really common word in the Hebrew Bible, and it's obvious why. Hearing is a very universal activity. It's usually connected with the ear, as in Proverbs chapter 20, ears that Shema and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. Now, that seems basic enough, but if you look at the other ways that Hebrew authors can use the word Shema, they use it to mean more than just let sound waves enter your ear. In Hebrew, Shema can also mean pay attention to or focus on. So when Leah, who wasn't loved by her husband Jacob, she has a son and she names him Simon, or in Hebrew, Shimon, because she says, the Lord has Shamad, that I am unloved. So Shema means to hear and to pay attention to and even more. It can also mean responding to what you hear. This is why so many of the cries for help in the book of Psalms begin with a call that God listen. Psalm 27 verse 7, Shema my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful, answer me. So asking God to Shema is at the same time asking God to act, to do something. It's similar to when God asks people to listen. Like when the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, God says, If you shema me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Now, there's a couple interesting things about this verse in Exodus. In Hebrew, the word shema is repeated twice in this sentence to give it emphasis. If you shema shema, meaning listen closely. But also notice that from God's point of view, listening is basically the same as keeping the covenant. So when God asks the people to Shema, what he means is that they listen and obey. And that's the last fascinating thing about Shema. In ancient Hebrew, there is no separate word for obey, meaning to carry out the wishes of someone who knows better than you or is in authority over you. So in the Bible, if you want to say, I will listen and do what you say, you use the single word Shema. In Hebrew, listening and doing are two sides of the same coin. 
This is why later in Israel's history, when the people were breaking their covenant promises to God, the Hebrew prophets would say things like, they have ears, but they're not listening. The Israelites, of course, could hear just fine, but they weren't actually listening or else they would act differently. And so in the end, listening in the Bible is about giving respect to the one speaking to you and doing what they say. Real listening takes effort and action, and that's the Hebrew word Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the third key word in this prayer, how Israel is called to love their God. But what does that mean? Love is a very common word in most languages, as it is in ancient Hebrew. It's pronounced ahava. It most basically refers to the kind of affection or care that one person shows another. It sometimes describes physical affection, like the king of Persia's love for Queen Esther. But there are other Hebrew words that more specifically refer to physical desire or sex. Ahava is more broad. So Abraham had ahava for his son Isaac, that's parental love. Jonathan showed ahava for his friend David, that would be brotherly love. In fact, a whole group of people can have ahava for their leader, like when the Israelites showed love for their King David. Ahava can even describe loyalty between political allies, like Hiram, the king of Tyre, loved David. They had good relations, and so Hiram wanted to help David's son Solomon build the temple. These are all different kinds of affection described with the one word, Ahava. Now all of this is helpful for understanding God's Ahava in the Old Testament. So in Deuteronomy, Moses told the Israelites, God showed affection for you, he chose you because of his Ahava for you. So God doesn't love because the Israelites earned it or deserve it. It simply originates from God's own character. He loves because he loves. This is why Jeremiah can say that God's love is everlasting. It has no end because it has no beginning. God's love just is an eternal fact of the universe. And God's love is not a duty, it's a genuine feeling, an affection that God experiences. This is why the prophet Hosea compares God's love for his people to a husband's ahava for his wife, or to a parent showing ahava for their child. It's one of the strongest things that God feels. But that doesn't mean that God's love is just a feeling. God's love is also in action. It's something God chooses to do. Like when Moses says, because of God's ahava for your ancestors, he brought you out of Egypt with great power. God's love isn't just a sentiment, it is something God does. And so in the Shema, Israel is called to respond to God's ahava by showing ahava in return. And just like God's love, human love is to show itself through actions. Like in Deuteronomy 10, What does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him and serve him and to keep his commands? All of these actions are centered around love. If I'm not doing them, I don't actually love God, I just say I do. Which leads to one last thing. In the Old Testament, I show my love for God by how I treat the people around me. In Deuteronomy, we read that God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he shows ahava for the immigrants among you, giving them food and clothing. And so you also show ahava for the immigrant. So the people are to imitate God's ahava by showing ahava for others. This is the idea underneath the famous line, you shall ahava your neighbor as yourself. And so at the end of the day, all of this is rooted in God's own eternal ahava. Like we read in the New Testament letter of 1 John, we love because God first loved us. And that's the Hebrew word ahava. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the fourth key word in this prayer, heart, which in Hebrew is sometimes pronounced levav, or more often in a shorter form, lev. Now, different cultures throughout history have had different conceptions of how the human body works, and this is also true of the ancient Israelite writers of the Bible. 
They knew that the heart was an organ in the chest that sustains life. There's mention of a heart attack in the Bible, Naval, whose heart died inside of him and he became like stone. But the biblical authors talk about the heart in many other ways that might seem strange to modern readers, and that's because these Israelites had no concept of the brain or any word for it. They imagine that all of a human's intellectual activity takes place in the heart. For example, you know with your heart in the Bible. Your heart is where you understand and make connections. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom dwells in the heart. And your heart is what you use to discern between truth and error, like Solomon did when he was king. So the heart is where you think and make sense of the world, and it's where you do more. In the Bible, the heart is where you feel emotions. You feel pain in your heart, like Hannah did when she couldn't have any children. In fact, the phrase, a broken heart, comes from ancient biblical Hebrew. You also experience fear in your heart. Your heart can melt or be distressed. Your heart can even be depressed. But then, on the flip side, your heart is where you experience joy. In Hebrew, to be happy is to be good of heart, or to have a heart of joy. So the heart is the generator of physical life. It's also the center of your intellectual and emotional life, and there's more. In Biblical Hebrew, the heart is where you make choices motivated by your desires. So David had it in his heart to build a temple for God. Your heart is where your affections are centered. They're called the desires of your heart. And if you really want something and go after it, it's like what Nathan said to David, whatever's in your heart, go and do it. So then, in the Bible, the heart is the center of all parts of human existence, as in the well-known proverb, guard your heart because from it flows your whole life. Now the prophet Jeremiah believed that the human heart was fundamentally broken. He said, the heart of a human is deceitful above all, irreversibly sick, who can even understand it? He had watched a whole generation turn away from God. They started sacrificing their children as if that were a good thing. So this is why in the imagination of the Hebrew prophets, the only hope for humanity is the total renewal of the human heart. Moses predicted that if Israel was ever going to love their God, their heart would need to be circumcised, which is a very vivid and surprising metaphor about removing evil and stubbornness from the human heart. David, after he committed murder and adultery, pleads with God to create in me a pure heart. The prophet Ezekiel hoped for a day when God would remove the heart of stone and give his people a new heart of soft flesh, which is very similar to Jeremiah's hope that God would write the commands of the Torah on the hearts of his people. And that brings us all the way back to the Shema. Every day, God's people are called to devote to God their whole body and mind, their feelings and their desires, their future and their failures. This is what it means to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the word soul. The Hebrew word is nephesh. It occurs over 700 times in the Old Testament. The common English translation of this word is soul, and that's kind of unfortunate. Here's why. The English word soul comes with lots of baggage from ancient Greek philosophy. It's the idea that the soul is a non-physical, immortal essence of a person that's contained or trapped in their body to be released at death. It's a ghost in the machine kind of idea. This notion is totally foreign to the Bible. It's not at all what nephesh means in biblical Hebrew. The most basic meaning of nephesh is throat. Like when the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness, they're hungry and thirsty, and they say to God, we miss the cucumbers and melons we had in Egypt. Now our nephesh has dried up. Or when Joseph was hauled off into slavery in Egypt, his nephesh was put into iron shackles. But nephesh doesn't only mean throat. Since your whole life and body depend on what comes in and out of your throat, nephesh could also be used to refer to the whole person. Like in Genesis, there were 33 nephesh in Jacob's family, that is, 33 people. In the Torah, a murderer is called a nephesh slayer, and a kidnapper is called a nephesh thief. On the first pages of the Bible, both humans and animals are called a living nephesh. And if the life breath has left a human or animal, the nephesh remains. It's just called a dead nephesh, that is, a corpse. So, in the Bible, people don't have a nephesh. Rather, they are a nephesh, a living, breathing, physical being. 
Now that might surprise you because most people assume the Bible says the soul is what survives apart from the body after death. And while the biblical authors do have a concept of people existing after death waiting for their resurrection, they rarely talk about it. And when they do, they don't use the word nephesh. So even though nephesh is often translated as soul, the Hebrew word really refers to the whole human as a living physical organism. In fact, this is why biblical people can often use this word to refer to themselves. And it gets translated me or I. Like in Psalm 119, most translations read, let me live that I may praise you. In Hebrew, the poet literally says, let my nephesh live that it may praise you. By using nephesh, the poet emphasizes that their entire being, their life and their body offer thanks to God. In the Song of Songs, the young woman constantly refers to her lover as the one my nephesh loves. And of course, love isn't just an intellectual experience, it's an emotion that activates your whole body, your entire nephesh. This helps us understand the brilliance of other biblical poets who could combine multiple meanings of nephesh in one place. Like in Psalm 42, we read, as the deer pants for the water, so my nephesh pants after you. My nephesh thirsts for the living God. So on a physical level, your throat can be thirsty, like a deer's, but then that physical thirst can become a metaphor for how your whole physical being longs to know and be known by your creator. Which brings us all the way back to the Shema. To love God with all of your nephesh means to devote your whole physical existence to your creator, the one who granted us these amazing bodies in the first place. It's about offering your entire being with all of its capabilities and limitations in the effort to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the Hebrew word for soul. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the last word, strength. The Hebrew word is ma'od, and it occurs some 300 times in the scriptures, and it doesn't actually mean strength. There is a perfectly good word for strength in Hebrew, and ma'od is not it. In fact, the Shema is one of the only places in the whole Bible where ma'od is translated as strength. So what's up with that? The most common meaning of ma'od is very or much. It's what grammar nerds call an adverb, a word that comes alongside other words to augment their meaning. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, God looks at the world that he's made and six times he calls it good, but then the climactic seventh time he says it is ma'od good, that is, very good. Later in Genesis, in the story of Noah, the flood waters keep rising and they become ma'od powerful or extremely powerful over the land. In the story of Cain and Abel, Cain wasn't just angry at his brother, he was ma'od angry. Or when Saul became the king of Israel, he was ma'od happy. So you can see why ma'od occurs hundreds of times in the Bible. It's a really common Hebrew word that intensifies the meaning of other words. Very this, or really that. However, biblical authors could use ma'od in ways that are unique. Like when they want to increase a word's force to total capacity, they'll say ma'od twice. So Jacob became ma'od ma'od wealthy with flocks and camels and donkeys and servants. Or the Israelite spies went to investigate the promised land and they say, the land we pass through is ma'od ma'od good. So it's pretty clear, ma'od doesn't mean strength in terms of muscle power, but rather very or much. So let's come back to the Shema, where people are called to love God with all of their heart, that is their will and affections and with all of their soul, that is, their whole life and physical being, and with all of their ma'od, that is, with all of their muchness. And while that sounds kind of funny, you also kind of get it. If ma'od can intensify any word's meaning to total capacity, then this final thing that you use to love God isn't a thing at all. It's actually everything. Loving God with your ma'od means devoting every possibility, opportunity, and capacity that you have to honoring God and loving your neighbor as yourself. It's the most wide and expansive word in the Shema. Ma'od can refer to almost anything. Which raises one last and really fascinating point. Because this word was capable of many nuances of meaning, ancient Jewish communities interpreted ma'od in the Shema in different ways. So the ancient Jewish scholars who translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, when they came to ma'od in the Shema, they translated it with the Greek word dunamis, that is power or strength. This is the interpretation adopted by most modern translations. 
But if you look at the ancient Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible, you'll discover that these scholars interpreted ma'od to mean wealth. Money is a concrete thing that opens up all kinds of opportunities to love God by giving away resources. And when Jesus was asked about the most important command in scripture, he quoted the Shema. And he used two words to unpack the meaning of ma'od. He said, love God with all of your mind and with all of your power. Both are human capacities that can be used to love God in an infinite number of ways. So which of these interpretations of ma'od is right? Does it mean strength or wealth or mind? That's the wrong question. The word ma'od doesn't limit the number of ways you can show love for God, just the opposite. The point is that everything in a person's life, every moment and every opportunity, every ability and capacity offers a chance to love and honor the one who made you. It's a call to love God with all of your muchness. And that's the meaning of strength in the Shema. Now, growing up in the church, I have heard this verse spoken and taught and sung, but I never had a great understanding of what the words I was hearing and saying and singing actually meant. So I hope that was a helpful 17 minutes for us to give us a better idea of what it means to listen and to love Yahweh with all of our heart, soul, and strength. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Shema became a twice daily prayer within Judaism. It was so widely practiced in the second temple period that Jesus himself grew up praying it. Uh, this prayer was formative for Jesus and he drew upon it in his teachings. So when he was asked which command in the Torah was the greatest, it's no surprise that he answered the first of all the commandments is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The Shema and its instruction also informed the disciples and their writings. In the book of Revelation, John, the visionary in his revelation, he drew upon this prayer to describe Jesus' followers. Part of the Shema prayer in Deuteronomy 6, 8 contains these words. You shall bind these words as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as symbols between your eyes. Now, the physical location on your hands and between your eyes is a symbol with fairly obvious meaning. Like your eyes are the place where you see and your hands are for like almost everything that you do. Now, this prayer was to guide the vision and the action of every moment of life. This is why John the Visionary says that in the new creation, when God's people live in intimate proximity to God and the risen Jesus in Revelation 22, that they will see God's face and his name will be on their foreheads. This picture of people who look to Jesus is a contrast to people who reject the way of Jesus. Those people have given their allegiance to other powers that are bent towards destroying them. Uh, these powers are depicted as beasts in Revelation 13. So John the visionary also draws upon the Shema to depict a human life on the path to destruction. The beast also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. So for John, the choice is a stark one. You either give your allegiance to Jesus and allow it to influence how you see and act, or your allegiance belongs to destructive powers that will also govern how you see and what you do in life. One path leads to life, the other to death. Now, all of these images and ideas come from Moses' words in Deuteronomy, specifically from the Shema. Now, the Shema is a beautiful prayer, but it also contains a powerful truth. There's a reason why God's people have been praying these words for millennia. They are simple words with the capacity to reshape the course of an entire life. The Shema can keep God's love and loyalty at the forefront of your mind and drive you towards obedience, not out of obligation or duty, but out of love. The words of Jesus in the Gospel of John flow from the Shema. The one who has my commands and keeps them, that's the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will reveal myself to him. But it doesn't start with us. Like, let us remember whose love started this whole chain reaction of love leading to obedience. We love because he first loved us. Like at the end of the day, following Jesus is about love. Love that came to us when we weren't looking for it. And as we receive this love, it generates gratitude and humility and a commitment to honor and love in return. Love creates more love. 
which results in faithfulness and obedience. Like these are truths that can transform us from the inside out. So perhaps it would be a great opportunity for us to memorize and pray the words of the Shema twice every day so we don't forget who our God is and how our God has called us to live. Listen, pay attention, hear and obey, put this into practice. Our entire allegiance is to Yahweh. He is our God alone, our ultimate authority. So let's love our God with everything we are, our mind, heart, desire, will, and action. Let's give it our all and then some more because he has shown us that same kind of love. So we show it back by loving Yahweh and loving those around us. The Shema is a great way to remember every day our calling from God. But we have another reminder we participate in every week as a church family. We meet at a table with Jesus, a table where he takes a piece of bread and he breaks it as a way of saying, I love you enough to let my body be broken for you. He takes a cup of wine and says, this is a symbol to show you how much I love you by creating a new covenant of my blood for you. So when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, let it be a reminder of love, a symbol of sacrifice, a proclamation of victory, and a covenant of love. So as we go to the table today, let us remember and proclaim, Jesus loves us. No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for. The one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. Do it all you can do With one word the mountains move When you breathe the dead arise And the bones come back to life There is power in this room Where the spirit of the Lord is There's life Tears down walls And every enemy will fall So we will stand and we will fight That every wrong would be made right There is power in this room Oh, I believe Where the Spirit of the Lord is There's life Where the Spirit of the Lord is
Hey, thanks again for being with us today. I want to remind you that the Sunday fun doesn't have to end right now because we open up a Zoom room right after that you can jump in, say hi to everybody. So look in the chat for a link and come say hi. Also Tuesday night at 7 p.m. we also have a Zoom Bible study. We just get together, open up the Bible, and we have great conversation, questions, discussions. So if you have never joined us, make that a new Tuesday night tradition. The more, the merrier. And also mark your calendar for April the 4th for Easter. We're planning a relaxed outdoor gathering to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and our hope of resurrection someday. Now, I've had a few people ask about in-person gatherings, so let me address that really quickly. Unfortunately, Easter Sunday is not a return to regular weekly in-person gatherings. Now, I did hear from the school this week that once Nashville enters phase four, the school will be available to use again for outside groups. So once that threshold is met, we're gonna make plans to move back into the building, gather in person for those who can. And we're gonna continue our online presence into the future as we navigate this physical and digital worlds of ministry. So if you can't meet in person on Easter, we're gonna, still gonna have an online service that day in addition to our outdoor gathering. So please be praying for our church family as we're nearing the return to in-person gatherings. We continue to need wisdom and discernment as we make decisions. But regardless of where we happen to meet on a Sunday, our daily prayer is the same. Let us love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. So let's live that out this week, and we will see you next Sunday right here online.